welcome to everyone. And uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here. I apologize we're getting started a few minutes late, but that's because we're looking for chairs, and that's a great problem to have. Uh, we do have a couple of seats up front beside Dr. Henderson, as intimidating as he is. Um, but we're going to have to, I know we're all a bunch of real Catholics and like to stay back, but we want to get you all forward, please. And then we do have one over beside my, this beautiful woman over here, and I can say that because she's my wife. <clears throat> My name is Scott Roy. I'm the uh, acting president of Catholic Pacific College. And we're at the start of another academic year. And it's very exciting to see, I'm, I mean, so many students here. It's very exciting to see you all here. And, uh, and so it's the beginning for Catholic Pacific and for Trinity Western University. And for those of you that don't know, and this is just sort of my little plug for uh, Catholic Pacific College. Uh, if you don't know who we are and what we do, we are an affiliate of Trinity Western University. That means every single one of our students here are Trinity Western students, and they're all pursuing one of the, I think, 48 now uh, degrees at Trinity Western. And because Trinity Western is a liberal arts university, every student, no matter which program they take, has to go through a core curriculum. And that's, of course, to give us a breadth of understanding, so we're just not narrowly focused within one region of study. But the exciting thing about our college is that for Catholics on campus, and really anybody who wants to study uh, from a Catholic perspective, we offer a kind of Catholic core that we call the Catholic Formation Track. So 11 of the 15 courses that have to be taken by students at the university can be taken here at this college. Catholic theology, philosophy, church history, liturgy and sacraments, beauty and the sacred. I mean, there's just a whole beautiful array of courses that can be taken here. Um, so that's what we do, that's what we're excited to be here for, and these public lectures that we hold are just one of those sort of extras and part of the university experience that we are pleased to offer to the greater CPC community as well. I encourage you to invite friends and family to these important educational moments, and I will say that as tight and as crammed as we are in here, if we're seeing that it's just um, overloading this place, what we can do is transfer it over to Trinity Western, where they have larger classrooms and everything, so it'll never be a, a, a time of, well, it's just too small and we can't go. Um, so, and, and actually, Dr. Husbands has, uh, has said to me that any time we can help, uh, and, and I just I was, I was humbled by the fact that he said, if you guys have like a fundraiser or something like that, and you want me to come and speak and say how closely connected our college and, and university are, please let me know and I'll come and do that. He also has said if we can rent spaces over there for free and that. So, hey, if we pack this place out, we'll, we'll start heading over there. And I think it'll be a great uh, ecumenical experience. Um, also, for those of you who aren't that familiar with us, we have mass on campus and you're welcome to join us. Uh, we do open it up to anybody who wants to come, Monday to Thursday at 11 a.m. I would also like to introduce you to our student executive this, uh, for this year, and only one of them, I believe, is here tonight, and that's Mark Fra Franchek. Where are you? Oh, there you are, right there. How do you say your last name? Franchek. Franchek. I was close. I was close. And Kaz <laughs> Kazmira Werewa is the uh, vice president, so uh, Mark is the president. And um, I would like to remark that they... Remark? that they raised money this summer uh, for beautifying the classroom. And all the artwork that you see in here, uh, they uh, raised money and they bought, uh, Mark himself slaved away on those frames, and he, uh, he and Kazmir put them up in here. But I would like to <laughs> make a special note. One of our students, the talented Maria O'Conn, yeah. sitting over here, painted this beautiful uh, piece of religious art here. This is St. Luke. It's a reproduction of, who's, who's the original? Sorry. Okay, of St. Luke, who is in fact our patron uh, of, of the college, our college patron. So thank you so much. We, over 100 hours spent on this. I mean, it, it is a beautiful piece of, of art. So chat with her if you want to know more. Um, but that is all I have to say for our sort of housekeepings and marketing campaign here. Now to begin, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, in his address, Christ, Faith, and the Challenge of Cultures, provides a definition of culture as the historically developed common form of expression of the insights and values which characterize the life of a community. So as a community, deriving a, a unitive force, something that brings together the unity 
uh, sorry, that brings together the people into a community expresses itself over time. And we understand that expression to be culture. Elsewhere, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger describes the Eucharist as the only one true unifying force on a universal scale. Only Christ has the ability to draw all men unto himself. And this Catholic community, this universal community, produces a universal or a Catholic culture on a truly universal level. There can be a connection then um, with beauty, because beauty has been described as goodness expressed. And in a world that stops up its ears to truth and is unfamiliarizing itself with goodness intentionally, it may be that, as Solzhenitsyn once wrote, perhaps the fantastic, unpredictable, unexpected stems of beauty will push through and soar to that very same place, and in so doing, will, will, will fulfill the work of all three, truth, goodness, and beauty. In other words, beauty works on a level that sometimes truth and goodness can't penetrate down to, and it speaks to our hearts. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says in uh, 2501, Created in the image of God, man also expresses the truth of his relationship with God the Creator by the beauty of his artistic works. Indeed, art is a distinctly, uh, distinctively human form of expression, beyond the search for the necessities of life, which is common to all living creatures. Art is a freely given superabundance of the human being's inner reaches. Arising from talent given by the Creator, and from man's own effort, art is a form of practical wisdom, uniting knowledge and skill, to give form to the truth of reality in a language accessible to sight or hearing. To that extent, or to the extent that it is inspired by truth and love of beings, art bears a certain likeness to God's activity. What a profound statement. It bears a, a certain likeness to God's activity in what he has created. Like any other human activity, art is not an absolute end in itself, but is ordered to and ennobled by the ultimate end of man. And so, over these next few CPC3 lectures, and I read that to you to give you context to why we will explore the way of beauty in Catholic culture. Working from November to today, in November we will have Dr. David Squires from Trinity Western University speak on music as prayer. Uh, with a subtitle, uh, Concert Hall as Liminal Space, Sacred Music in Our Time. In October, we will have Professor Alan Hoheim from St. Mark's Corpus Christi speaking on, his, the title of his talk is, Of Kingfishers and Other Fires, Inscapes as Patterns of Being in Hopkins, Gerard Manley Hopkins he'll be dealing with. And tonight, we have our very own Father David Belushi speaking on uh, Metaphysics of Creativity and Jacques Maritain and Flannery O'Connor. Now, Father David belongs to the Dominican Order founded by St. Dominic in 1216. Having obtained his canonical licentiate in theology, Father Belushi completed his doctorate in philosophy at the Dominican University College in Ottawa. His research and publications have focused on St. Augustine, Thomas ethics, and the Italian Renaissance, 16th century humanism. Father Belushi has taught in Canada, South Africa, Colombia, and India, and he continues with his pastoral ministry in Rome in the summer months. I mean, he is a globetrotter, if ever I heard of one. He's everywhere, and especially in the summertime, there's no way to get a hold of him. Actually, you're in Rome. That's, if you want to find him, you got to go to Rome. Um, his areas of teaching, research, writing include ancient, medieval, modern philosophy, Renaissance humanism, St. Thomas Aquinas, moral theology, scriptures, church history, Catholic spirituality, the list just goes on. Father Belushi also completed an MFA in creative writing at the University of Nebraska, and he'll actually be leading a creative writing group here in the college um, starting, I think, this week. Uh, with his background in creative writing, Father Belushi is published in Canadian and international poetry journals. His academic and poetry books are available at the TWA, Norma Marion Allo uh, Alloway Library, here on campus. And Father Belushi is a member of the Canadian Jacques Maritain Association, the Canadian Society for Renaissance Studies, and the 16th Century Society and Conference. And he joined the CPC faculty the same year I joined here, and it's my certainly my pleasure uh, to introduce you to Father David Belushi. Come on. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, 
It's wonderful to be here. It's been a while since I've given a paper, one of these CPC3 talks, so it's nice to start the year with uh, creativity. And this is the topic of my paper. I'll be looking at um, Jacques Maritain, this French uh, neo-Thomist, and uh, Flannery O'Connor. And the focus is on creativity. What makes the person creative? All right, so I'm not actually looking at literature as such, but what motivates the literature that we, that we read. So I'm focusing on creative writing, the inspiration of the writer, the connection with reality, and we will see this with um, both Jacques Manatin, Flannery O'Connor, the subjective experience of desires and emotions that reflect the author's aim to unveil the mystery of the human being, right? The human being as mystery, things in the world, and ultimately God. So I look at the thought of Jacques Manatin and his work. The focus uh, of Jacques Maritain is, is a work of his called Poetic Creativity or Creative Intuition. And the writing of Flannery O'Connor, one of her works, a short uh, story of hers that we shall see later. There will be some references to it. And then I also have uh, a few poems that I'm going to read for, from my last uh, two poetry publications. I wasn't able to, during COVID, to be able to read from the last one. And more recently, I have another poetry publication. So I'll just read uh, a couple of poems from the two publications. So I'm actually going to interrupt for a second and say a prayer. I will not be able to get through this if I have not said a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The first part, then, is somewhat technical because it involves um, metaphysics and Jacques' approach to, uh, Jacques Maritain's approach to metaphysics. This French philosopher is considered a neo-Thomist. He died in 1973, so not that long ago. And his description of poetic creativity is this intercommunication between the inner being of things. So intercommunication between the inner being of things and the inner being of the human being. All right. Such creativity, he says, has its source in the pre-conceptual life of the intellect. All right. So that is the faculty of the intellect, the faculty of the human soul, where there is the source of spiritual power, right? So the pre-conceptual life of the intellectual, uh, of the intellect. And this is where the source of spiritual power um, we are going to, that we're going to find in creativity. As a literary art, poetic creativity is a virtue of the practical intellect, also referred to as techne. And in literary creativity, there's also the exercise of the intuitive reason, which is referred to as nous, right? These two predominate. So Maritain is going to build on Aristotle's techne and nous, respectively, these intellectual virtues. Now, while creative language is made up of images, it conceals the logical or intelligible sense of the intention to evoke emotions, right? So creativity does not always make sense. We need to search for the meaning to find out what the intention of the author or the writer has. And in this process, what we experience are our emotions being evoked, but uh, this is based entirely on words. And if you think of it, how can words, these letters on text, evoke emotions? So while the creative word speaks, language seems to defy logic or reason, right? So while we have meaning to words, how can these words at the same time evoke emotions in us? This seemingly uh, escapes reason because of the obscurity that we are led to as a result of language. So the 
the unknown, the unknown, the mystery of the person, the mystery of the situation, the realm of possibilities, all of this is the area of the unknown. So then the Maritan says the logical sense, which is the actual meaning, it has been digested by the poetic sense, which is how language is being used. And the poetic sense is that inner ontological source of the creative piece. So the poetic sense is that ontological, meaning the very being of the creative piece. So poetic, the poetic sense provides the work its very being, right? The very being of the work, the substance of the work, the significance of the work is found in the poetic sense when we are talking about creativity, right? How language is being used as a creative art. The poetic sense is that interior source of language, language play and creativity, that drives the literary work, whether it's a poem, whether it's a short story, whether it's um, a play, Creative activity relies then on intuitive reason and creative intuition. Both are used. How we intuitively understand the thing in itself, that is reality, the object in reality, and then how our creative capacity makes use of that reality. So poetic intuition is born primarily in the spiritual unconscious and emerges from it. All right, so this reservoir reservoir of uh, spirit, if you want, this pre-conscious that is often characterized in Greek mythology by the invocation of the muses. Remember in Hesiod's Theogony, the opening lines where he states, begin our singing with Heliconian muses who possess Mount Helicon, high and holy, and near its violet strain spring of pedal soft feet, dance circling the altar of almighty Cronion, right? So this invocation to the muses is basically this call to inspiration, this call to the muses to bring inspiration to the person, right? So this is expressed in um, the Greek uh, mythology by the muses. So Maritain distinguishes then between the preconscious of the spirit and the psychological. So a person is not to think when he's talking about pre-conscious, he's not talking about something psychological like sort of repressed matter in the unconscious sense. This is not what he means. He is basically saying that spiritual rev reservoir of um, knowledge, of information that we have, that we don't always access and that we're not always aware of. While creativity is to be found in this spiritual unconscious, the tendency is to associate reason, he says, with conscious logical tools. So the conscious is sort of the logical use of the word. It's the spiritual unconscious that gives the creativity to the meaning of these words. So Maritain maintains that far beneath the tools and determination, so uh, rather than words being determined, used as a way um, as a predetermined way, he says that the spiritual unconscious is that which gives the creativity to these words. The intellectual faculty where the spiritual powers are found differs from the sensory faculty of the soul. So we think of the soul as having a spiritual faculty and also this sensory faculty. Uh, through the sensory faculty, we, we receive information. Through our senses, we receive information about the world around us. By these sensory experiences, where data are received and enlightened by the intellect, so we receive information of the world around us through our senses, and then our intellect is engaged, the spiritual faculty, to inform us what, what it is, what the thing is. Based on sensory re reality, then, we can choose to reconfigure, and this is where creativity comes in, we choose to reconfigure the things around us, and this is where um, we exercise our imagination, all right? Governed by reason and the will, the spiritual faculty then determines the reorganization of the sensory data that we have received from the external world of reality. This relationship between the intelligence and reality reflects Aquinas' basic principle that the intelligence 
adheres to external reality. And this uh, adequatio, where the intelligence adheres to external reality, is what we call truth. What we call truth, or what Aquinas calls truth, and what we call truth. Aristotle understood this relationship between the intellect and the external world as presented in his De Anima on the soul. The intellect has a capacity to grasp the essence of things, so the essence of a thing or the reality of the external world by what is received by the intellect passively, such as colors, shapes, textures, and then by what is grasped by the intellect actively. So the intellect receives passively and then it grasps actively what the thing is, knowing that something is. Aquinas's contribution to the Aristotelian metaphysics is that the intellectual power of the soul is neither one that the uh, philosopher of Arouez would have it in his interpretation of the intellect as this kind of monopsychism, that is, we all share this common intellect, or the intellect as illuminated by um, divine, by the divine, by God, as Augustine would have it. So Aquinas does not take either of these sort of what he considers, considers extreme positions. For Aquinas, individual knowledge is acquired through the intelligence, right? So through the intelligence, how humans, how humans come to make sense of reality through sensory experience. So you have the intelligence and then you have the reality of our sense experiences, whether it's tactile or visual, audible, and so forth. And this is ultimately what we do in creative writing, rearranging these sensory experiences moved by this spiritual source, this spiritual power, uh, this pre-conscious that we have in, this, in the spiritual faculty. Drawing from Aristotle, Aquinas refers to the eliminating, illuminating intellect, the possible intellect, because it can receive all things, like the spiritual sun that radiates within us. It is this light that causes ideas to arise within us, right? a light permeating our spiritual faculty like the sun. The uncreated intellect refers to God, right? Only God's intellect is uncreated. The human intellect is created, created ultimately by God. So our intellect is both created and creative while God radi radiates and activates the intelligence. So how does this differ from St. Augustine? God, God in Augustine is causal, the cause of our coming to know and knowing, as the word is made intelligible through the soul where God speaks to us, right? Whereas for um, Aquinas, this is going to be largely through sensory experience. Our knowledge is largely the result of sensory experience and then the intellect grasping what we have received. Maritain further describes poetic activity as the freedom of the creative spirit. Literary creativity implies not only the integrity of both the intellect and the imagination, so both are, are there, but also sense, desire, love, instinct, and spirit. So what we also have, of course, are these very subjective categories. The creative writer needs to return to the creative source, a hidden place at the center of the soul, where the totality of being exists. Creative writing cannot be limited to the act of the intellect, but finds its source in the preconceptual or the spiritual unconscious of the soul. Free creativity of the spirit encounters infinite possibilities and choices. You can just think of all the different ways in which you can arrange and rearrange words. In this sense, the poet becomes godlike, just as the third point of view is an omniscient writer making decisions about characters. Maritain compares the writer or the poet to the first poet, the first poet, of course, being God, to show the parallels in the godlike activity or creativity. The subjectivity of the poet is transmitted in the deep ontological sense. Right? The totality of the person as poet, as creative writer, just as divine creation presupposes the knowledge God has of his own essence, poetic creation presupposes the poet's capacity to grasp his own subjectivity to create. 
The poet needs to pass through the door of his own subjectivity. So we can say that there is this encounter between the subjective and the objective. The subjective poet who is driven by his uh, experience of desires, desires, um, feelings, and so on, and then the objective reality that uh, is encountered. So he needs to pass through the door of his own subjectivity. Unlike the divine essence, the subject of man is unknown to himself. And this is the thing, as a poet uh, or someone who is a creative writer writes, they come to know themselves in the writing. While self-knowledge is not the objective of the poet, a person doesn't write to get to know themselves, the writer in creativity discovers this self-knowledge that is often presupposed or obscure. All right, a person thinks they know themselves, and as they write, they discover new things about themselves. Such a writer knows himself as a result of knowing the world of things, the objective world around him, this explains why poets and other creative writers lead the reader to explore the inner world. Who am I? Where am I going? What is the purpose of my life? These are questions that nihilistic philosophers such as Nietzsche could not answer and failed. Thus, the creative writers need to grasp both the objective world around him and the inner world of uh, or subjective state. The creative intuition is an obscure grasping, as Maritain states, of oneself and of things in the exterior world through a knowledge of or connaturally born in the spiritual unconscious. So we have this connaturality with the world around us because when we receive things, Right? When we, through our senses, when we receive things, we receive them through our senses and then our spiritual faculty that grasps the things that are. Right? There is this co-naturality and yet there's also an obscurity that exists between us and these things that are known. So the willingness to uh, approach and penetrate the unknown. This is basically what the creative writer is doing. He is penetrating the unknown. And in this, we could say there is a Socratic wisdom um, rather than the uh, wise man who knows everything, far from the self-proclaimed wise man, uh, that Socrates targeted in his dialogue. The creative writer is aware of this kind of poverty in the lack of what is known. Right, this ongoing exploration in creativity. Maritain, like Aquinas, has an anthropological understanding of the person based on human nature, natural law, not the individualism of the 20th century, where each person creates their nature. This creative spirit that results from co-naturality with the world around us generates then creativity. Creative knowledge, Maritain asserts, proceeds from the intellect, but through the instrument of feeling. Right here is where he's going to emphasize feeling. Feeling as emotion can be further understood in metaphysical terms. Feeling is one with creative intuition, producing the form to the poem and contains the intentionality of the idea. So the driving force of the poem or the creative work is going to be the feeling that the author wants to convey. The intention of the poet writer relates to the idea that is contained within, right, within the, the author. Following St. Thomas, intention for Maritain refers to the tendency towards existence. The object known in the immaterial sense is instrument, an idea representing a tendency, that is to say, an intention towards the object. The question Maritain raises is how can feeling be raised to the intellect, replacing the concept by becoming the instrument through which reality is grasped. So feeling is actually raised where we would have the intellect exercised in what is a, a logical um, way of looking at the world around us. Now it's feeling that is the driving force in the creativity. 
Feeling or emotion means the soul suffers the pathos that leads to the spiritual unconscious of the intellect or subjectivity. That means the soul is being acted upon. The soul is the poet, the soul in the poet, and other creative writers remains available to itself, a reservoir of spirituality in the recesses of the soul because the soul is not absorbed by outside activities and consumed by these uh, powers. The poet's intuition, therefore, is spiritualized emotion. Right? So the emotion of the poet, of the writer, is this spiritualized emotion. Um, humans, all humans are capable of poetic intuition. This is not something that only certain people have. It's just like virtue. All people can acquire virtue. All people can acquire this, uh, are capable of poetic intuition. Okay. So um, it's always good to, to um, try different poetry exercises and see what kind of results you get from that. As Maritam points out, objective reality and subjectivity, the world and the soul respectively coexist inseparably. inseparably. All right, now to uh, move on to Flannery O'Connor and the realism, realism of creativity. Flannery O'Connor was committed to understanding 20th century Catholic theology, including the work of Jacques Maritain. O'Connor's writings suggest this Aristotelian Thomistic influence, and she acknowledged um, that she was metaphysically grounded in reality. Her works were intended to be uh, a connection or reflection of the real world. In fact, she admits that the most notable influence on her writing is St. Thomas Aquinas. O'Connor's Catholic orthodoxy and finding answers in Aquinas made the Georgia author something of a Thomist. O'Connor herself writes with humor. I read the Summa Theologiae for about 20 minutes every night before I go to bed. If my mother were to come in during this process and say, turn off that light, it's late. I, with lifted finger and broad, bland, beatific expression, would reply, on the contrary, I answer that the light, being eternal and limitless, cannot be turned off. <laughs> <laughs> O'Connor recognized the influence of the Catholic Church on her own writing. I feel, this is quoting now O'Connor, I feel if I were not a Catholic, I would have no reason to write, no reason to see, no reason ever to feel horrified or to even enjoy anything. At the same time, O'Connor asserted that when someone's faith is weak, they cannot appreciate an honest, fictional representation of life. O'Connor even credited Catholicism with her insight into the prevalent Nietzschean nihilism. Catholic teaching served as a basis in her own writing to oppose nihilism in literature. O'Connor's battle against nihilism found strength in the Catholic Church. And following Maritain, O'Connor cultivated the habit of art, a virtue of the practical intelligence that has its basis in truth. Citing Aquinas, O'Connor states, the artist is concerned with the good of that which is made, comprehensible through the senses, metaphysics rooted in an Aristotelian empiricism. And following Aristotle and Aquinas, Aquinas O'Connor understood that the senses were the beginning of human knowledge, to know what is true and good. Maritain's assertion reflecting the poet, O'Connor understands as extending to the fiction writer. The whole personality takes part, the conscious as well as the unconscious. And echoing Maritain, as O'Connor states, the writer learns, perhaps more quickly than the reader, to be humble in the face of what is. To be humble in the face of what is. 
O'Connor's Catholic education and philosophical background convinced her that in the philosophical plunge into rationalism, followed by later idealism, reason was detached from faith experience. At Sweetbriar College, Virginia, in 1963, O'Connor states, The supernatural is an embarrassment today, even to many of the churches. With cynicism sets in a loss of sin, redemption, and judgment. But the modern world, as O'Connor asserts, does not believe in the sin or in the value that suffering can have or in eternal responsibility. And since we live in a world that since the 16th century has been increasingly dominated by secular thought, the Catholic writer often finds himself writing for a world that is unprepared and unwilling to see the meaning of life as the Catholic writer sees it. Instead, art and creativity aid reason to remain balanced, as Aquinas affirms, reason in making Reason and what appears as unreasonable work together for the Christian writer because what appears as unreasonable, O'Connor maintains the assumption, this is the assumption that underlies the use of it, are those of the central Christian mysteries. Right? If we're always trying to be rational, we will find that we cannot rationalize the central Christian mysteries. And this is why, as O'Connor states, we need both faith, and reason, even in creativity. The value of the physical world, sensory reality, has a divine source. The sacramentality that O'Connor emphasizes, God's goodness, is to be found in a created world, a sacramental sign pointing to the divine. O'Connor views are clearly anti-Manichaean. In fact, O'Connor remarks in relation to Manichaeanism that the religious writer who fails to penetrate the world may have been made more definite by one of those Manichaean type theologies which sees the natural world as unworthy of penetration. Writing as Western society suffers the trajectory from Cartesian relativism, Enlightenment demystification, and finally Nietzschean nihilism in a prophetic manner, O'Connor interprets Western civilization in a battle for its future. And she is writing in the 1960s. On the one hand, the risk of philosophy and religions being eradicated, where Nietzsche yearns for a new world order, a world without God governed by science, the secular vision of the person, Christian culture finds itself on the other side of the battle. O'Connor builds on her Thomistic worldview, harmonizing Catholic theology and Greco-Roman philosophy. In her private library, O'Connor kept the lecture given by the Thomist philosopher Frederick Copleston, St. Thomas, and Nietzsche. In his article, Copleston identified Nietzsche and his followers as active nihilists who sought to overthrow the old order. Such nihilists aim to create a new order and a new society. Nihilism mobilizes man to destroy the old order and create his own order as creator thereby replacing God. Only a Thomist metaphysics can establish objective reality and absolute truth. O'Connor's presentation of evil largely follows that of Aquinas while she emphasizes the good Evil by no means is absent. This accounts for O'Connor's position that evil is the defective use of the good. In Jack Manitan's work, The Range of Reason, O'Connor recognized the need to revive reason, but in a balanced fashion where reason cannot replace mystery and faith. Reason cannot take the place of revelation. The Enlightenment project failed. O'Connor states, the age of the Enlightenment substituted reason for revelation, with the result that confidence in reason has gradually decayed until the present age, which doubts also fact and value. Reason finds few supporters outside of Neotomus philosophy. The loss of trust in reason leads to the reliance on feeling, truth, goodness, love, sin, faith, 
God becomes a matter of feeling. In her prophetic language, O'Connor recognizes the tendency towards science with its Cartesian, Lagrangian source. Science dominating human matters, to, so the one who decides and determines activity and decisions is the expert. This elite group of experts in society shapes human beliefs and values not even limited to the area of their proper expertise. At the end, common sense is lost altogether. The virtue of prudence features prominently in O'Connor, O'Connor's thought when dealing with social issues at a practical and personal level. In treating prudence, both Maritain and O'Connor draw from Aquinas. It matters not only what a man does, not only what a man does, but also how he does it. The goal to be achieved, therefore, is not only what matters, but how one goes about achieving that goal. O'Connor affirms that truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it emotionally. She sees the artist's role to uncover the strangeness of truth. Thomas Merton, in reference to O'Connor, O'Connor's work after her death compares O'Connor to Sophocles. For all the truth and all the craft with which she shows man's fall and dishonor, the creative writer then builds their work around moral truth. The moral depth of O'Connor's writing clearly indicates she does not separate her Catholic faith, the core Christian values, from the creative text. O'Connor's writings, her impulse towards creativity within a moral framework, drama that has meaning, gives her the qualities of a prophetess. There is a difference between identifying the right and wrong as conveyed by the narrative, poetic or prose, and reading the creative work, having one's life transformed as a result. O'Connor situates herself in the latter. A person's world is changed, or one's perception in an encounter with a creative work driven by moral truth. The moral of a story, the author's moral vision, should lead the reader to how to live their life. One cannot simply state that O'Connor's Catholic upbringing led to, her, led to the moral vision of her creativity, but rather her influences coming from St. Thomas Aquinas and reinforced by the neo Thomas Jacques Maritain, placing O'Connor in a metaphysical field, manifesting itself in prophetic terms. She had something to say of a prophetic nature to the world and that she possessed the imagination to do so aesthetically. This is affirmed in Edmondson's work, Return to Good and Evil. She was inspired in her craft, this is a quotation from Edmondson's, she was inspired in her craft insofar as she believed she was invested with the opportunity of serving as some kind of prophet. O'Connor acknowledges the prophetic role of the writer. His kind of vision is a prophetic vision. Making reference to her spiritual mentor, O'Connor states, according to St. Thomas, prophetic vision is not a matter of seeing clearly, but of seeing what is distant and hidden. All right, so um, the work I'm going to look at then, this short story, is called View of the Woods. In O'Connor's short story, View of the Woods, we encounter the ritualistic whipping of Mary Fortune by her father. She's mine to whip, and I'll whip her every day of the year if it suits me. While Mary denies being whipped by her father, repeating, nobody beat me, and if anybody did, I'd kill him. While Mr. Fortune was against the beating, this would be uh, her grandfather, he ends up beating his granddaughter himself. And Mary reacted towards her grandfather, her grandfather beating her, as she repeatedly, repeatedly stated, nobody beats me, and if anybody did, I'd kill him. The nine-year-old kills her grandfather. And as Mr. Fortune beats Mary's head, she, too, is finally dead. O'Connor does not employ violence for the sake of entertainment, as she states. 
With a serious writer, violence is never an end in itself. It is the extreme situation that best reveals what and who we are essentially. The final scene displays the grotesque of human nature, raising the metaphysical question, what are humans essentially? What we are made of is known by our actions. In the view of the woods, the grandfather and granddaughter are juxtaposed in the narrative. Mr. Fortune regards his daughter as a fortune, that is the father, grandfather's surname, his progeny, an extension of himself. He kills her at the end because he cannot possess her. Pitts, his son-in-law, would not either. Mary allowed her father to beat her because, in her reasoning, she belonged to him. She even collaborated with her father's beating. Part respect and part something else, something very like cooperation. For O'Connor, free will follows traditional Catholic teaching, and she points out nobody is really interested in determined type characters. The grandfather and the granddaughter violently, violently killing each other reflects the radicality of free will without any predetermined features. You don't expect, expect a grandfather to kill his granddaughter and vice versa. You don't expect a granddaughter to kill a grandfather. We are essentially free moral agents. Mr. Fortune thought he had complete control over his granddaughter, only to discover that Mary Fortune identified herself as pure pits. Okay, that's her father's surname. As she was being beaten, angry, her grandfather sold a parcel of land blocking the view of the woods. So on top of it, she was angry at her grandfather for selling the land. Land keeping her father's animals from grazing and her siblings with no place to play. All the more reason to kill her grandfather. But Mr. Fortune ignored all this. He owned the land and believed he owned Mary Fortune too. Is the essence of man's nature to immortalize himself at all cost? Or do we see in Mary Fortune the essence of man to see something transcendent beyond the view of the woods? And with that, a deeper understanding of relations that connect us to each other and to God. These are the metaphysical questions O'Connor raises. To conclude then, O'Connor clearly draws from St. Thomas directly and indirectly. She builds on Aquinas through the Neo-Thomas, Jacques Maritain. Creativity in writing conveys not only the essence of being human, but its expression in our relation with the others and our connection with God. So, um, having ended the paper, I'm going to just read um, a couple of poems then from my last two um, poetry books. This was also supposed to be, uh, well, is, not supposed to be, but is, uh, a book release. The only thing is I did not bring my poetry books with me. I brought Flannery O'Connor with me, all right? So, <laughs> so I don't actually have my books here, <laughs> but um, I'll just read these, these poems. The first one is Silent Wings. Many of the poems that I have are sort of re uh, reflection on um, childhood, right? And this is one of them. We faced northern mountains. I pulled back the seat and pushed my cousin, Isabel, hands tight on the chains of her swing. Her laugh screams, aiming for white clouds. Breeze cuddles me. Egrets pose their neckline. A storybook river surrounds us. I drink summer grass. The seaplane hums into afternoon dandelions. Birds pierce the turquoise. She motions with her cotton fingers. I find my tough boy strength. I jump onto my swing. Ce ceaseless, pleasant rhythm. A sudden force sends my body high. Isabel laughs. I wondered who catches us in heaven. Um, okay, this... this uh, <laughs> This next poem is um, shortly after I was ordained. My first mission was in Rwanda in uh, Africa, and it wasn't too long. Uh, I mean, there were still memories of the genocide. Uh, Rwanda had gone through a genocide. So this poem is called Soaking uh, Rwanda. 
Hairline, height, income, education. Rampage begins. Arms and ammunition. Centers of command to execute. Wild youth. Interahamwe. White, red, green extremists. Machete marches. Peasant axes. Army prepares its surgical mission. Single target. National killing machine. Slaughter for security. The propaganda controls thought. Friends turn into spies. Sellouts. Murderers. Blood despised, blood shed. 900,000 too late. Stench of blood villages, red drenched mud roads, river dammed by corpses. The world watched Rwanda soak. Um, this, this following poem is from the last book called Oxford Street. Uh, in Oxford Street, I draw from Greek mythology a boy's um, childhood experiences, and then Freud, not Freudian, but just psychology, um, a number of different classical psychologists, right? Uh, blue horizon, equine, equine shape of the Pegasus, positioned in the front court, Doric pillars stand, twiny grapevines hang, clay vases contain orchard, separate green hedges, separate green hedges. I hear the sea, rhythmic splashes, far below, an echo along the Athenian shores. I understand why Pegasus waits, his wings flap with grace. Pegasus catches the open space into the horizon. Embraced by the blue sea and white cloud wisps, my journey outlined before me. Place unlike where I live, my destiny blurry, calm caresses me. All right, it's um, a poem on fate, actually. How much can control do we have over the decisions we make. This last one, um, called Isolated, takes place in the um, intensive psych unit of a hospital. Um, it takes place, I was there um, giving spiritual support. The a poem is called Isolated. And the poem also is written visually. There are certain spaces between words and um, lines. I hear my name prolonged. Excitement, a voice I recognize as if a forgotten friend. Eyes in her direction, then mine. She accompanies me to her room, past the station without an emergency alert in case. My friend brings me to her room, which puts a desert monk to shame. Bed, lights, blackboard, window, her voice hoarse. She tells me to wait. Doors, door opens. She leaves with permission. As I sit on her bed, Walls white, writing on the board, erased, another cloudy day. Mattress uncomfortable, I have nothing to distract me or keep me busy. I wonder how long before she returns. My hair falls over my eyes as I look down, my hands folded on my knees. I occupy the room, alone, isolated, observed. And that's it for the poetry, and that's the end of my talk. <laughs>